before my cancer. Yeah. Right, right, right. Okay, we finished uh, sec um Verse 40, chapter 22, and Ahab is laid to rest with his ancestors, and Ahaziah, his son, takes over as the next king. Yehoshaphat ben Asa Melech al Yehuda were up to Pasuk Mem Aleph, 41. In the meantime, I mean in the meantime, while the king Ahab passed away and his son succeeded him, during this time Yehoshaphat, the son of Asa, is the king over Yehuda. Bishnas Arba Laachov Melch Israel in the fourth year of the reign of Achav. Yehoshaphat ben Shloshim Bchami Shana ben Melcho. Yehoshaphat was thirty-five years old when he ascended to the throne. Ve'esrim Bchami Shana Melach Bidushalayim and for twenty-five years he ruled in Jerusalem. Bishem Imo and the name of his mother was Azuva Bashilchi. He went in the ways of Asa, his father. His father was righteous, and so he too, uh -oh, Yehoshaphat, was a righteous king. He walked in the ways of his father. He did not deviate Lassos from that from that path in life. And Lassos Hashem. He did that which was straight and proper in the eyes of God. Nevertheless, the private altars were not removed. Now we're talking about, the, thank you, in the kingdom of Yehuda. What stood in the kingdom of Yehuda in the city of Yerushalayim? The Beis Amigdash. During the time, or once the Beis Amigdash was constructed by Shlomo, Hamelech, Obama's private altars became prohibited. So notwithstanding the fact that Yehoshaphat did righteously in the eyes of God, Notwithstanding the fact that the Beis Hamikdash stood in Yerushalayim in its full glory, the private altars were not removed. Meaning, people resorted to private altars. Od ha'am mezachim u'mekachim ba'bamos. The nation, the people, were still using and sacrificing on private altars. And we discussed, I think, the lure or the attraction of private bamos. What was the lure of a private altar? Well. The lore was as follows. You didn't, have to be, you didn't have to go to. Uh, That's right. I've had a a, a um, miraculous experience. I survived, God forbid, a car accident, <coughs> or something else in those days. Maybe a camel would have run you over. Yeah. Okay, so you want to celebrate? You want to thank Hashem? You want to give a Thanksgiving offering? And lo and behold, you live in Beer Sheva. <coughs> Now you live all the way in the south of the country. What do you have to do to bring a Thanksgiving sacrifice? You need to close up your store. Probably you had a falafel stand. You had to close up your store and you had to um, pack up your, your belongings. And if you had a camel, you were lucky and you could make it to Yerushalayim in, I don't know, three days. You got to Yerushalayim, well, you may have come in contact with a dead person, meaning you have a, may have attended a funeral somewhere along the line, and you need to now purify yourself with the ashes of the Paraduma. So you go um, up to the um, Har Habayas there, and you get online to um, receive um, your purification from the ashes of the Paraduma. Do you think you're the only person online? No. You have to take a number. You know, they had one of those number machines, and you pulled out a number, <laughs> and you had to wait until it was your turn. How long did you have to wait? I don't know, a couple days. Let's say you had to wait two, three days till it was your turn. So now you've traveled for three days. You get to Yerushalayim. You're waiting your turn for the ashes of the Paraduma. It's a seven-day process. So three days and three days waiting your turn, seven days. It's 13 days since you left home, and now you can bring your carpet. Well, you go to the base I make dush and you tell the Kohen, you know, at the door, I want to bring a carbon. He says, huh, you think you're the only one here? Get online. Well, you got to take another number. Who knows how long it took you then? Let's say one day, two days. You're six, 15 days out. Ah, and you're online. You know how, you know how enthusiastic you are when you stand online? 
Oh my God. what's going on here? Oh no. <laughs> you get online and you lose your, your, your fervor. You had all this spiritual motivation to come and give a thanksgiving offering to Hashem. Whoa, you had this miracle, you survived, everything's good. But you know, in 15 days, the fervor has gone downhill. And you no longer feel so passionate about giving that Thanksgiving offering. Now it's your memory, okay, fine. You muster enough kavana, you bring your carbon, and then you got to go home. Another three days. 18 days you're out bringing this carbon. Your store, your falafel stand, well, now there are three more falafel stands that opened up. So, you know, what are you going to do? You get back, you don't have any business, it's hard, it's this, it's that, your wife is screaming, what took you so long? And then you end up, this is when you had to bring a carpet. So what happened? Why don't I just go into my backyard, take a bunch of stones, gather them together, make a mound, make an altar, make a carpet to Hashem, and I am still spiritually passionate, and I can offer this sacrifice. That was the lure of the private sacrifice, the private altar. A tremendous yetzahara, a tremendous urge to do it, and it's a spiritual urge. I want to do a spiritual thing. Of course, it's the wrong thing. Why is it the wrong thing to do? Well, because the Beis Hamikdash stood. So what if the Beis Hamikdash stood? Why does that make it so I can't offer this private all? This because private Hashem is only at the Beis. Because our God makes the rules. We are servants of Hashem. We serve Hashem at the whim, under the rules mandated by the Master. If we're a true servant, if we're a true Eved Hashem, then we muster the proper Kavana and we go to the Beis HaMikdash. We get up every morning and we go to Shul. And even though it's the same thing we did yesterday, or maybe even in the afternoon we went to Menchem Arab, now we need to have fervor over and over and over again? Yes, because that's the rules of the Master. You must demonstrate total fidelity to the Master three times a day, 365 a year, and if it, unless it's a lunar year, 354, and whatever it is, you got to do it every day because you are a servant, you're an Eved Hashem, and that's what an Eved does. An Eved is a servant. A servant doesn't say to his master, why do I have to do this? Or why do I have to do that? It doesn't make any sense. Why, why should I do it? No, when you're, when you're a servant, when you're an Eved Hashem, you have to follow what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants, and He really wants us to be God-conscious all the time. And that's why there's three prayers a day, that's why there's Kashrut, that's why there is, in the time of the Migdash, there was no coming in contact with a dead person unless you were forced to under the circumstances, there was purification, there was all this to make us God-conscious 24-7, 365 days a year. Or 354. Okay, so that's what happened. And they're bringing the bones. And, just so you note, it's a fast forward because we got a lot of territory to go till the end of the kings. It will continue and persist to be an ongoing um, of a failure of the people to observe what the rules are, what a Baruch Hu wants. No matter how righteous the king, the king can't get into everybody's mind, and the king can't no matter how outstanding his leadership is, prevail upon the people to give up that spiritual spark that was misguided. Now Yehoshaphat makes peace with the king of Israel. This is a very, um, not a problematic, because of course peace is always um, desired, but what he's doing here is making peace with evil kings. Now, Ahav was the king of Israel, who, together with his wife Jezebel, who introduced the worship of Baal into uh, the kingdom of Israel. He was a Russia. In fact, as the Mishnah in Sanhedrin says, Ahav is one of the kings. You know, call Yisrael Yeshlehem Chelek Laolam Abba. Every Jew, by by virtue of being born a Jew, or by virtue of his converting to Judaism in a proper manner, has a chilek in olam haba. We each have a chilek in olam haba. There's only one proviso. We don't do anything to destroy 
our chilek in Olam Haba. Automatically, we would have a chilek. The only thing we can do is destroy it. Says the Mishnah, Ahav was a person, a king in fact, who lost, who lost his por portion in the world to come because he introduced Baal, he introduced the Baal, the, the, the idol Baal, the worship of Baal into Israel. And therefore, he lost his chilek lo Olam By the way, in the Gemara, they bring another opinion, contrary to the opinion of the Mishnah. They bring an opinion that says, Dorshe Rishumos, those who um, um, interpret lists, because Achav is in a list of three kings and four individuals who don't have a Chilik no Olamaba. Say the Dorshe Rishumos will always comment on all the lists that are in the Mishnah. They say, Achav Yesh no Chilik no Achav did not totally lose his chilek in Olam Haba. He still has a minimum portion in Olam Haba. Why? He made cities in Israel. He built cities in Israel. One. Two, what else did he do? When he was wounded on the battlefield, he refused to retreat and go back for medical treatment. He was bleeding out. They could have stopped the bleeding and treated him and maybe saved his life. But he refused to leave the battlefield. He propped himself up in his chariot in which he was wounded. And he stood at the back of the, of the army in a demonstration of bravery. He bled to death so that his soldiers would not lose heart and flee the battlefield. It would not lead to a rout of the army of Israel. And therefore, because he bled out al Kiddush Hashem in a sense to sanctify God's name and protect the people, to protect his soldiers, he does have a chilek in Olam Who are the other two? Excuse me? Who are Nasha and Yeruvim Ben Avot. So I have a question. Yes, sir. In Olam Abba, two are missing. What does that mean, two are missing? Those who are not. Menashe and, and, and Yeruvim Ben Avot? There is not a completion of the Israel. Well, don't ask me these Kabbalistic questions. <laughs> you know, and I'll tell you one thing. If there is a problem, which it might be well there is, God solved it. Okay? He's in charge upstairs. And uh, whatever he did, he did. So we can't really question. I don't get into what goes on upstairs because there's no way to know, right? How do we know what's going on upstairs? Yeah, there are lots of people who try to tell us what's going on upstairs, but I don't subscribe to uh, many of those opinions because if God wanted us to know what goes on upstairs, he would have put it in his Torah. And it's not there. He, it's not important to us. And the Rambam says in the end of the Laws of Kings, when he discusses the advent of Mashiach, he says nobody knows what's going on upstairs and what will happen. Not the Chachamim, not the great scholars of the Mishnah, nor the great scholars of the Talmud, and not the prophets. Even the prophets who are blessed with divine revelation, they do not know exactly or even mostly what goes on, Bashamayim, what goes on at the end of days, what goes on when the great day of judgment arrives, what goes on when with Tchiyas HaMesim, what goes on when there is Mashiach himself and Ulam Abba. We don't know. Most likely we don't know because we could not comprehend it. Okay, but anyway, we don't know. Okay, so now Yehoshaphat makes peace with the king of Israel. Now, why is that? We don't make peace with evil people. We should not make peace. Okay, you can have cordial relations, but to go out of your way to make a treaty, a covenant, a peace, a peace agreement with uh, idolaters, it doesn't fit that well. Well, let's see. Why does he make peace? So we discussed this, I think, last week. We said Yehoshaphat was the son of Asa. Hazal tell us, that in the days of Asa, his father, who was a righteous king, it was destined that the two kingdoms come together. Malchus Yisrael on one hand and Malchus Yehuda on the other hand were split apart in the days of Rehavim, the son of Shlomo, because of Shlomo's failures towards the end of his life. So therefore the kingdoms were split and it was destined 36 years later in the days of Asa for the kingdoms to merge back together again. However, also went and hired foreign mercenaries 
in a war against the kingdom of Israel, and therefore because of that, he not only didn't, well, he achieved at least a standoff, but he didn't achieve a total victory, and the nation was not united, and therefore they were split. Now along comes Yehoshaphat, his son, who is righteous, and he too wants to form some sort of connection with the king of Israel. He is interested in <laughs> reuniting the two kingdoms. One of the steps that he takes is he marries the sister of Ahab. He marries the sister of this arch sinner because he wants to draw. You know, in Europe they used to make these alliances by, you know, I don't remember which one, King Philip married somebody from another country, whatever it was. They used to make these marriages of convenience with the ruling family or the duke or the count or whatever it was from another kingdom in order to draw the nations together. That's what King Solomon did. And that's what Shlomo Amel did, although he um, did it and yet yeah, in order to assure that the Beis Amigdash would be a true house of prayer for everyone. But anyway, yes, they're different Yehoshaphat. So Yehoshaphat made peace because he was trying to draw the nations together, the, the two separate kingdoms together. There was one nation really, but two kingdoms. So that's why Yashlem Yehoshaphat in, in Pasuk 45, he made peace with the king of Israel. But Yasser did Rey Yehoshaphat, and the rest of the matters of Yehoshaphat and his valor, his victories, Asher Asa, that he did, that he performed, Asher Nilcham, and the wars that he waged, Shalom Ksuvim, Al Sefer did Rey Yehuda, they are recorded in the chronicles of the kings of Yehuda. Yasser HaKodesh, and the rest of the women of ill repute, Asher Nishar bimei Asa Aviv, the remnants that survived the purge made by his father Asa, Bier min he cleansed the land from them. Okay, so he did a very good thing, one of the great things that he did during his lifetime, which is mentioned here upon the recordation of his death. And there is no king in Edom. And David removed the kings, conquered Edom, but he had regional, as so we see, we would say today, governors. And there was no king, there was only Nitzav. There were only these regional governors. Excuse me. Yes, sir. Weren't we obliged not to conquer the Edom? We were obliged not to wage war with Edom. Um, that was on the way into the land of Israel. Um, because Hashem says, do not try to conquer Edom and merge it into it, the land of Israel, because Edom was given to the B'nai Yisayir, B'nai Yisayir, B'nai Yerusha, and we're not allowed to start up with them with a war to conquer their land. But we did conquer. Well, here they were a vassal state, where they were paying tribute to the king of Israel, actually. Okay, Melachim, Melamimim, David, okay. Why is this recorded here? Because now we're going to read soon about a revolt by the king of Edom against the rule of, um, of, of the kingdom of Israel. And uh, just as mentioned, it's like a setup, it's like an introductory sentence to tell us ultimately Edom will restore its monarchy in defiance of, of Israel, the kingdom of Israel, and there will become a war that will ultimately develop. Yoshafat Osa Onios Tarshish, Lechas Ophira Lazahov, the Lohalach Kinishbara Onios Beetzion Gov. Yoshafat following in the footsteps of King Solomon, of Shlomo Amela, had a fleet, or, or had a fleet constructed, Zuntai, had a fleet constructed of boats that would be seaworthy, that could go all the way to Tarshish. Tarshish is the um, port along the Mediterranean somewhere, where Yonah ben Amita, Yonah the prophet, was fleeing to when God told him to go to Nineveh and prophesize about the calamity that would befall them if they did not repent, and he hopped a boat to Tarshish to flee Eretz Yisrael, to, to get out, to flee Hashem, 
to flee Eretz Yisrael in order you know, to get out from uh, uh, from the Holy Land, thinking that once he left Eretz Yisrael, he would no longer receive divine revelation, and therefore he would be freed from the messages that God was shooting at him to go to um, to go to Nineveh. So that's the, that's a port Tarshish. He made boats that were seaworthy that could travel all the way to Tarshish, and he sent them south, down down I guess from Elat down south, Olechas Ophira, to go to Ophir, which was this um, kingdom. Well, who came from Ophir? The Queen of Sheba, where there was gold. Olechas Ophira Lazahov to go down south to along the coast to Ophir and there to obtain, purchase, acquire, trade for gold, it didn't work. His ambitious program did not work. Notwithstanding the fact that he made seaworthy boats, the boats broke up on the rocks apparently, and um, in Etzion Gover, that's all the way down by Elat, they never got out of the port apparently, they broke on the along the rocks, the, they didn't have a deep enough channel built in a lot for, in the waterway to get out uh, to get out to sea, and so they broke up. Ozamar Achazia, so Achazia, who is the king of Israel, says to Yehoshaphat, Achazia ben Achav, the son of Achav, El Yehoshaphat, Yehu avadayim avadechabaniyos. Let's do a merger here. Let's make a consortium between my fleet and you'll re, you'll rebuild your fleet. And we'll make this joint venture, and we'll go south, and we'll prospect for gold, or we'll find gold, or we'll buy gold, whatever. The low of all Yehoshaphat. Yehoshaphat did not want to do that. He did not want to make a joint venture with Achazia for profit. His his manner or his approach was yes, if we can find some spiritual way to make something work between us, good if we can reunite, but I'm not interested in opening up a, a gold exchange with you, Yehoshaphat, with you, Achazia. So, that's another thing that he did, and he persisted in that, um, uh, you know, refusal to join Achazia all the way to the end of his life. Vayishkav Yehoshaphat imam and Yehoshaphat was laid to rest with his father, by not having united the nation, his his mission was was he ended in failure. By David, he was buried in the city of David, um, where who was his great great grandfather. and Yehoram, his son, rules in his place. Yehoram, the son of the tzaddik Yehoshaphat who married the idolatrous wife, the sister of Achav, apparently, and produced this boy, or young man, Yehoram, he became the king. Okay, so that was a short interlude. We switched from the kingdom of Israel to the kingdom of Yehuda. Now what are we going to do? Back to the kingdom of Israel, or in the meantime. Achazia ben Achav, Molach Yisrael. Achazia, the son of Achav, ruled over Israel, B'Shomron, in Samaria, B'Shnash V'Asrei, L'Ho Yehoshaphat, Melchor in the 17th year of Yehoshaphat, there's some question of the calculation, and what the answer is, it's really off by seven years, and the answer to this is, is that Yehoshaphat should have died. Remember now, when Achav went to war with Yehoshaphat, to fight Edom and to fight, um, to fight, not Edom, but to fight Moab, Right? He's, and the Navi told Achav, you're going to die in the battle. You're not coming home safely. So what did Achav do? He switched clothes with the king of Yehuda. He adorned himself with the royal garments of the king of Yehuda. And he told you, Yehoshaphat, the king of, Israel, the king of Yehuda, you wear my clothes. We'll switch clothes. Mm -hmm. Okay? Thinking that if they switch clothes, maybe he would escape death because he would not be, so to speak, officially the king of Yehuda. He would look like the king of Israel. And it says there that the army of Moab attacked. They attacked <clears throat> the army of Aram there. They attacked, they attacked Yehoshaphat, thinking he was the king of Israel. It was not Moab, it was Aram. The mm -hmm. king of the army, they fought in Aram. 
And the king of the army of, of Ben Hadad, the king of Aram, told his soldiers, focus on the king of Israel. I, I don't care if we win this war, it's the third war. I don't care if we win the war, we lose the war, I want the king of Israel killed. And so the focus of the soldiers of the army of Aram was on the king of Israel. However, they must, may mistook Yehoshaphat to be the king of Israel because he was wearing the uh, royal clothes, the colors of the king of Israel. And when they drew close and were pressing the attack against Yehoshaphat, he started to scream, you got the wrong guy. I am not the king of Israel. I am the king of Yehuda. So there's two explanations to Vayizak. He cried out to identify himself, or he cried out to Hashem in prayer to save his life, and of course they say he, they did not kill him. Is it tzaddik or tzaddik? Um, I think it's with the tzaddik. With the tzaddik, I think it's to Hashem. You know, with, with the Zion it means that he gather everyone together. But uh, it's with a tzaddik, he cried out, he cried out. Did he cry out to tell them I'm the king of Yehuda? Or did he cry out to Hashem, or did he do both? both. Most likely he did both. both. Okay, so anyway, how do we get into this? Okay, so we say it's not really 17 years, but there were 7 years added to Yehoshaphat's life because he prayed to Hashem for salvation. And those seven years he should have been dead because they should have been able to kill him in this battle where they mistook him. But he was saved by some miraculous fashion and therefore those seven years aren't counted to his life. Okay, whatever that means. This Ahazio, son of Ahab, okay, the idolator, rules over Israel for two years. A very long time, considering. He does evil in the eyes of God. He walks in the path of his father. Who is his father? Achav, the wicked king. And in the ways of his mother. Who was his mother? Jezebel. He walks in the ways of his mother. Following this pattern first set by Yeruvim ben Avot, the actual first king of Israel. Asher hefti es Yisrael. Not only did he sin personally, but he caused Israel to sin by um, embracing. Here was the next passage. By Yavod es Baal, he served Baal. He worshipped Baal. By Yishtachavelo, and he bowed to him. By Yichas es Hashem Elokei Yisrael, he angered God in all that he did. Kechol Asher also Aviv in the same fashion that his father Achav angered Hashem. So too did he, Ahaziah, anger Hashem, but he had no redeeming qualities. Whereas Ahav may have had some redeeming qualities, which we mentioned, Ahaziah had none. And so he dies after two years. Guess what? We have completed the Lachim Aleph. Now, as I said to you when we first started to study, there is no such thing in our tradition as Malachim Aleph and Malachim Beis. Kings 1, Kings 2. That is a fabrication of the Christian pub publishers. When the printing press was developed, and the first thing that the Gutenberg press printed was a Bible. Bible yeah. The first printed book was a Bible. Now, the Chinese may have had printing, but in terms of the Western world, the, the invention of the printing press and the first, print, the first uh, book that was published was the Bible. In the process of printing the Bible, the Christian scholars divided the Bible into books, which we also had books, but we and we had sentence structure, but we did not have chapters, nor did we ascribe numbers to the Pesukim, numbers to the sentences. But in order to make it easy to follow and to reference the Bible, so that you know one person who's studying the Bible can relate to another person who's studying the Bible and say, where are we up to? Like when I come in here and I say, where are we up to? We need to know chapter and verse. Yeah. So they made chapter and verse as part of the printing of the first Bible. And that's how it, it stuck, because it was a good idea. So we say, we appreciate so wisdom. What? Did the Jewish, Jewish way do it? Chapter and, and verses. 
we didn't number the chapters. If you take a look, for instance, in the parish of the Abarbanel, yeah. who lived in uh, what, in uh, 1492, he was one of the expellees from Spain. Spain so yeah. in the end of the, I guess, what do they call that, the end of the 15th century, or, you know, 1492 or so, the Abarbanel's parish, he wrote a parish on all of Tanakh. His parish on Tanakh does not follow chapters. You ever notice in the Chumash, there's a Samach, there's a Pei. The Samach stands for Sidra, some type of order in the, in, the, in the Masoretic text. There's a break in the Torah, in the written form of the Torah. The scroll of the Torah has a paragraph break. That's a Sidra, that's a Samach. And the Abarbanel followed the Samach. And he wrote his parish based on Samach to Samach. From one sum up to the next. Nothing to do with chap not nothing to do, but not the same as the chapter breaks. He wrote his parish based on the breaks in the Masoretic text. And that's how the Rishonim before him looked at and viewed the uh, the, the, the Torah text and the Tanakh. Not like the Christians and not subsequent to the printing of the Bible, but predating the printing of the Bible, they followed the Sidra, these the breaks in the in the text. The Masoretic text, Rashi, the Ramban, all of those we shown him followed the Masoretic text and did not reference chapter and verse. That's a Christian concept, which we have adopted. Because, again, as I started to say, about going Tamin, when the Goyim have a good idea, we might as well follow it. It's not. It's not that they have that many good ideas that can inform us how to study and how to learn. But okay. Perhaps another example is the Socratean method of study, which was adopted in the academies of um, Eretz Yisrael and Bovel when they studied Talmud. But anyway, let's, uh, or even Mishnah. Okay, anyway, let's get back to the story here. We are now in what the um, Christians have told us is Malachim Beis, Kings 2, Chapter 1. So, so, can I interrupt you for a second? I just, sure. got, a, I just got a message from Rabbi Mordechai Machos. He's going to resume his class at the OU that he had for many years on Sunday night. He's going to resume tonight, and he's going to be teaching Kings 2. If you like that, maybe he's going to listen in to us. <laughs> Do not let him steal anything that we say. But it conflicts with Lady Wolf. So. All right. Eight, eight o'clock. Okay. Right. Why did the Christian world um, break it up there? Why did they two? make Kings 1's Kings 2? Yeah, or why this why demarcation they? right now? Because they wanted to make it easier, you know, instead of saying um, King, instead of saying Kings chapter 59, you know, you got to go thumbing through to find it because it was one big Bible. So this is just an <laughs> arbitrary Yeah, this is a, this, it's not 100% arbitrary. There is some sense to it because there is a pretty much a midpoint. This is the midpoint in Kings. So they decided to make it into two, two books so it would be easier to follow and find and reference. Of course, I wasn't there when they made this decision. I'm just speculating. All right, so we start Kings 2. Vayivsha Moab and Moab rebels against Israel. Remember, now Moab was a vassal state of the kingdom of Israel. Achre Mos Achav, when they heard Achav, who was a warrior king, who um, okay. was quite brave, and as I told you before, he died on the battlefield in, a, in an act of supreme bravery. When Achav died, they revolted. Achazia was nowhere near as formidable a warrior king as his father. Um, in many ways, he was not formidable at all. Well, Achazia is now pacing around, very distraught that he has a, revol a revolt on his hands. After all, Moab was paying tribute, he was um, lining his coffers, his treasury, and so he's pacing around, and he's wondering, what can he do? Guess what? He falls through a weak point, also in his upper attic, he had lattice work on the floor so he could look down and see what's going on beneath him uh, when he was up on the top floor. And the lattice work was not strong enough to hold him. Maybe he was uh, corpulent. Anyway, he falls through the lattice work by Yochal, and he gets sick. He has to be put to bed. He's injured. 
Vayishlach Malachim, and he sends messengers, his messengers. Vayomer Aleim, and this is the directive that he gives to his messengers. Lechu dirshu b'bal zavuv. Go and seek the counsel with Baal Zavuv, the master of Zavuv. What's a Zavuv? A fly. Go and seek counsel by Baal Zavuv, Elohei Ekron, the god of Ekron. Am I going to survive this illness? Go and ask the master of the fly. That's an idol. Or an idol. What in the world would anybody call their idol master of the fly? Why would you name your idol? Or why would you worship something called Master of the Fly? You know, there was a horror movie about the fly, but you know. <laughs> why would you want to make your idol the Master of the Fly? So I heard from Rabbi Eitz Shalom, who says that it really was not called Master of the Fly. But when the Navi wants to record the idol, he wants to do it in a mocking uh, denigrating a manner. So whatever the real name of this idol was, the Navi calls him Master of the Fly just to denigrate him. I don't think that's the shot, but that's his shot. I think the shot's like this. It tells you in, in Chumash Bereshus, You man, God says to Adam, to mankind, you go and you rule over the animals of the world whatever, in, in, in the fields, in the, in the forest, wherever it is, you rule over the animals. Do we rule over the insects? Notwithstanding those zappers, we don't really gain control over the insects. I mean, it takes massive, uh, what is it, uh, poisons to, um, we spray, we this, we that, but we never beat them. They are always coming back again. Genetic engineering. Yeah, genetic engineering. There's what? What is it? Um, what's that? West Nile. There's malaria. God forbid. All of these things that are spread by insects, and while we may control them for some time, they rise up again, and there's another disease, and another onslaught, and another. We never win the battle. It's an ongoing war. What does that mean? That means no matter how masterful man is over nature and over what's going on in this world. One of the things we never control is possible. It's the vote, the simple little fly. Matter of fact, the Gemara records that when Titus, a Russia, the man who destroyed the second temple, when he was bragging about how he defeated God, in a sense, by burning down the base of Mikdash, a Bosco went out, a heavenly voice decreed, God saying to Titus, I will show you that you're not so masterful. And a little insect flew in through his ear, went into his brain, went in and, and ate his brain, and he died of terrible pain, uh, like you would say, God forbid, a, a brain tumor. So what happens here? God shows him that a little fly is more powerful than the mighty armies of Rome, and that's what it is saying here. Dear Shuba Balzavov, go seek the counsel of this Balzavov. They elevated this fly because the fly was unconquerable. It was the master. He was the master of a human being. Human beings could not control the fly, so they decided to serve the fly. The god of Ekron. And he said to his emissaries, Seek counsel from the god of Ekron as to whether I, Ahaziah, the king of Israel, am I going to live from this illness? It's not an illness, it's broken bones or whatever it was that, uh, that I suffered when I fell through the, um, the svacha, the latticework. And guess what Hashem does as a result of that terrible Yichilol Hashem. The king of Israel is not just sending, you know, when surreptitiously, openly he's serving, he's, he's saying, I don't want to go seek a, a, the counsel of a prophet of God. I want to seek from the emissaries or the prophets of this Baal Zabur. So Hashem decides this is another occasion to call Elio Hanavi out of retirement. Because it's dealing with the house of Ahab, and Elio was the arch protagonist against the house of Ahab. So, Ma'ach Hashem Diber Elio HaTishbi. And an angel of God speaks to Elio HaTishbi from, you know, 
Bitoshvei um, Tako, actually. Kuma Leila Kras Malchi Melech Shomron. Go out and go meet or greet, go against, confront the messengers of the king of Shomron. Bedaber Aleyem, and this is what you should say to them. Aleyem, to them. Amibli Ein Elohim Bi Yisrael. Is there no God in Israel? Atem, you, you emissaries, Holchim Lidros for Baal Zavuv or Hey Ekro. You have to go and seek counsel from Baal Zavuv, the God of Ekro. Lochem Koamar Hashem. Therefore, so says God. Amita Hasher Olisa Shom, the bed upon which you are lying, which you went up upon. Lo say Raven you're not going to go down from this bed. Kimos Tomus, you're going to die. Now notice here, Vayelech Eliyahu and Eliyahu went to fulfill the mission of Hashem. This is a very interesting thing, because first God says to him, address the messengers. And he says to the messengers in a sort of accusatory tone, is there no God in Israel that you are listening to the king and you're going to seek um, the counsel of Baal Zubov as if it has any meaning, as if you believe in it, as if there's going to be any not to positive, any any result that has any effect, any effective result, you're going to talk to an idol. It's a meaningless mission. How can you go? What are you doing? But then he says, go back. You become my messengers. The king of Israel sent you as his emissary to the god of Ekron. Now I'm going to cause you to do an about face, turn around, you become my messengers, you go back to the king, and you tell the king he's going to die. And the bed upon which he is lying, he will never leave it, he will never recover, he's going to die uh, as a result of the wounds that he incurred when he fell through the lattice. And then Eliyahu goes to follow the mission of Hashem. So that's what Hashem told him to do. By Yeshua HaMalachim love, and now the messengers listen to Eliyahu, and they turn around and they go back to the king of Israel. And the king says to them, How would you get back here so fast? What are you doing here? I sent you on a mission. And they said to him, Someone came to greet us, to meet us, to confront us. And he said to us, Turn around and go back to the king. Asher Sholach Eskem, who sent you on your mission. Vidi Barte may love and say to him as follows. Ko Amar Hashem, this is the word of God. Amibli ein Elohim kim bi Israel. Is there no God in Israel? Ata Sholach Lidrosh Bebal Zavuv Elokei Ekron, Elohei Ekron. And you have sent to seek the advice, counsel, whatever, of Baal Zavuv, the God of Ekron. Therefore, the bed upon which you ascended, lo sered mi meno, you will not descend from it, ki most of us you will die. So now when the messengers return, they put the whole onus of what happened here on the king. Whereas Elio said to them, why are you undertaking this mission? You should have refused, you should have told the king, this is a meaningless mission you're putting us on because there is no essence to the Baal Zavuv. And what are you sending us here? Wasting our time, your time, and you will not get any... Yes? Which means you may disobey the king. Of course you can mis disobey. The halacha is when the king tells you to do something which is impermissible against the halacha, you need to refuse. Well, maybe he'll kill you, then you have an Indian of the court. Nefesh maybe. But certainly you should not undertake a mission to a broken, wounded, uh, um, you know, weakened king. He should have said to the, they should have said to the king, Your Majesty, if you really want to get healthy, if you really want that Hashem or that forces should intervene to help you get better and cure you, seek, seek the God of Israel. Seek Hashem. Don't send to Baal from Your Majesty. Please tell us to go to a prophet of God and seek his counsel. Respectfully. Who was the prophet at that time? Okay. Well, there was Elisha, there was Eliyahu, there was, um, you know, other prophets. Okay. Okay. So they turn around, and when they come back to the king, 
they put the whole onus on the king. Whereas Eliyahu accused them, well, so in the name of Hashem, why did you agree to such a futile mission? They don't put it on themselves, they put it on the king. Go back to the king and speak to him. This is what Hashem said, and this is what they tell the king. How may bliyein Elohim be Israel? Is there no God in Israel? Therefore you're seeking counsel from this ineffective Baal's book. Therefore, the, the bed upon which you have ascended, you will not, you will not descend from it. You're going to die. Vayedaber aleihem. And now comes a very interesting sentence. One thing we didn't mention, we glossed over, is that Elio does not identify himself to these um, messengers of the king. He just confronts them, interrupts their mission shocks them by telling them they're going on a futile mission and directs them to return to the king which they undergo he must have had such charisma such powerful uh you know a presence that he got them to turn around without identifying himself as elio the radak wonders how is it possible that such a strong personality as elio and Navi, who confronts all the who confronted Ahab, zebel and other kings of israel was not known to these emissaries. How did they not know that this was Elio? Also, the Radak suggests that they were young soldiers just recently drafted into the army and they didn't have a history of knowing who Elio was. But anyway, the king says to the emissaries, Ma mishpatayish, what did this man look like? I share all across them who intercepted you and confronted you. And he spoke to you, he spoke to you these terrible things that I'm going to die. Who was this man? Who was this masked man? No, he wasn't masked. Who was this man? Right. He had long hair and he had a biker belt. A big leather belt on his hip. That sounds like Vine too. By Omar, and then the king says, Oh, I know who it is, Elio Hanavi. It's Elio Hatishbi. Wow. I know who he is by your description. What does this tell us about Elio? Did he look like every other prophet? Did he dress in black with a cartel and a spudic? Huh? Was he unidentifiable in his black garments? Was he indistinguishable from other prophets? No. He had a unique way of dressing. He didn't follow the norm. He dressed so he would have a distinct personality and that he would stand out as an emissary of Hashem, easily, quickly identifiable. <clears throat> he dressed differently. He wore a white garment with a big leather belt and he had long hair. Some say he was a Nazir. That's why he had long hair. Some say he had a fight with his barber. No, I mean, he just had long hair. Okay. Bezer or Azor Bemasnav, he had a big belt um, girding his loins and his hips. Vayomer and the king says, Elio, this is Elio. So now the king says, ah, this is my, this is the old nemesis of my family. The man who caused my father such anguish and pain. The man who prophesied his death. The man who said the dogs would eat my mother and they did, or they will. Anyway, this is our enemy. So he says, and he sends out to seize Eliyahu. Sar Chamishim V'chamishav. An officer of 50, say a captain in his army, together with 50 troops. Love and the man went after Elio. Vihine Yoshev al Roshahor, and Elio's there on top of the mountain. Vayedabere Love and the commander, the captain, says to him, Yishu Elokim, man of God, Hamelach Diber Redah. The king says, Come on down. Come down from your lofty perch on the mountain. We're taking you in. Come on down. And it's by the command of the king. And Eliyahu responds. He says to the captain of the 50, And if I am truly a man of God, 
Teirev ish min Let a fire descend from heaven because of your disrespect and your affront to demand of me that I come down and to say you're taking me in as a captive. Teirev ish min Let a fire descend from heaven. The tochal oscha, it will consume you. The and the 50 men that are in your cohort, for they did not protest um, in the manner with which you um, affronted me. And all of a sudden, a fire descends. You know, Elio is the one who keeps commanding fires to descend. He said it on Mount Carmel, let a fire come down. Another time he says, now let a fire come down. Bolts of lightning come shooting out of the sky. And it burns into a crisp. This um, uh, this uh, arrogant uh, commander with his cohorts, with his men, and they're dead. Innocent men. What? Innocent. Innocent men that stood by and watched the denigration of the prophet. Remember, now Elio is not one to you know you don't you don't. Uh, uh, what do you call it? You don't toy with Elio. You don't play games with Elio. Elio is very much a kanoi, very much uh, a zealot, very much invoking anger of God against him, and at one point against the whole Jewish nation when he declared a drought for three years and people suffered and he was trying to bring them to their senses to realize that their paganistic, idolist, uh, idol-worshipping ways were going to bring about total ruin of the nation. He has no fear of invoking the wrath of God. You would say in the modern language, he was fire and brimstone. And so Eliyahu says again to these 50, you disrespect the prophet of Hashem. Remember now, there are very few prophets walking the earth uh, upright because Ahab and Ezebel wiped out all of the students and all of the people training and all of the prophets that actually emerged as prophets. He had them all killed. And so there are very few, and it, therefore it's very important that the prophet receive the proper um, respect and adoration of the people so that the prophet can mentor and teach. And here these 50 men were treating Elio as if he'd be some common criminal and demanding he come and, and, and threatening to take him in, you know, probably in chains or whatever. And so Elio um, unfurled the wrath of God. And he sends the king, not deterred by whatever happened. He finds another 50 soldiers and he sends them. Now these 50 soldiers have to be suicidal. Because if they're going to come and they're going to demand that Elio surrender and come and be taken in in the same manner, disrespectful manner that the first 50, they're going on a suicide mission. So listen what they do. And they respond and they say to Elio when they track him down, man of God, so says the king, right, get out down here right this minute, not a second delay, right down here now. Elio says to him, and he says, if I am truly a man of God and you have the chutzpah, to talk to me like that, Tered Eishmin Hashemayim, let a fire descend from heaven, v'tochal ozva v'es hamishach, and it will consume you and your whole cohort. V'tered Eishmin Elokim and Hashemayim, and the fire of Elokim, the God of justice, descended from heaven, v'tochal ozva v'es hamishach, and it consumed the second cohort of men, the commander and his fifty men. Again, this time worse, they disrespected Elio in even a greater measure than the first. The first group says, come down, and this one said, right at this minute, immediately. So the king sends another 50 men. He says, I got plenty of soldiers, I'm going to keep sending them. These guys had some seichel, so listen what they do. A third group of 50, Vayal, they come, Vayovo, and they come, Sarah Hamishim Hashlishi, this third cohort of men. Vayichral Birkavi bows down, Leneged Elio. He prostrates himself on the ground and bows before Elio. Vayishane Neilov, and he supplicates to him, he prays, he begs him. Vayadabar Elov, and he says to him, Mishalokim, man of God, Tikar no Nafshi. 
Let my soul be precious. Let it have some value. And the souls of all these 50 men who are under my command, let them have some value in, in your eyes. Please do not consume us with the fire of heaven <clears throat> the way you destroyed the first 50. <clears throat> we know that a fire descended from heaven. And it killed and burned the first two officers of 50. Or shown in the first two groups, Bez Chamishem and all the fifty men that were under their command, Bato Tikar Nafshi Beinacha. Please let my life have some value in your in your eyes. So they pleaded with Elio, and they and they begged him, and they asked him, please understand that we are we were dispatched by the king, but we mean no affront, we mean no disrespect, we are just following our orders, please, please spare us. This time Hashem intervenes and speaks to Elio. See how Hashem knows who he's dealing with here. He knows Elio has got a short fuse when it comes to disrespecting the prophets of God. So he says to Elio, raid Osa, go down with him. Descend from the mountain. <clears throat> Do not be afraid because he's not intending to harm you, and nothing bad will befall you. And he gets up, Elio, and he goes down to the king. Now the question is as follows. Why was Elio afraid of them in the first place? Hashem tells him, don't be afraid, go down. Go down from your mountain and, 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 and go with them. What, is Elio afraid of them? make any sense, does it? <laughs> Elio, afraid of Achat and Zevel, he fled from them. When Izevel tells him, tomorrow I'm going to kill you, he ran away. Why didn't he stand his ground? Why does he run away? So, this gets us to a very interesting point, which I cover in my next book, which I will tell you here today. Can an individual exercising his or her free will, kill an innocent man, kill a messenger of God, a Navi Hashem. Can I decide that I hate this Navi, and in the exercise of my free will, I want to kill him, I want to assassinate him. Can I do that? Or will Hashem protect that person and foil my, my um, exercise of free will? Or, in other words, can you, kill, can you kill an innocent person? A person who's not guilty of a capital offense. Can an individual kill somebody who's not guilty of a capital offense? Well, there's a Torah article that I came across in a journal. And the, um, uh, the head, it was written by Rabbi Aviner. I don't know if you've heard of Rabbi Aviner. He's the, uh, the Rosh Hashiva of... Um, the yeshiva in the old city, um, Ateret Kohanim. And Rav Avinir has an article, a Torah article, and it, the title of this, this article is, it's in the Hebrew, Hayim Yesh Ketovet Bakol Kadur. That means, is there an address for every bullet? For every? Bullet! Every bullet, is there an address? Meaning, are you, if a guy, if somebody shoots a gun, does the bullet kill because that person, there's an address to it, it's directed by Hashem to that person? Or there's no address to every bullet, it could be haphazard. Or in another way, can a person exercise his free will and shoot and kill somebody who's not guilty of a capital offense? So, Rav Aviner, quoting from the Vilna Gom, actually quoting from Rabbi Rafael Mivaloshin, the brother of the Vilna Gon, in the name of the Vilna Gon, the Gra says that a total a tzaddik, let's call him like somebody like Eli Yohanavi, a tzaddik, could not be killed by anyone exercising their free will unless Hashem wants his prophet dead. If Hashem doesn't want the prophet to die, meaning that he's not guilty of any sin that would warrant his death, an individual cannot bring about his death. 
And that's what he talks about, um, therefore saying that if there are soldiers on the battlefield and they get shot and they die, it's because God has directed the bullet to that address. That's his, uh, that is his conclusion. I disagree very strongly with that conclusion. Benachilas kavot Raso, you know what that means? Notwithstanding the um, force of his Torah knowledge, I think that on a battlefield, the Gemara says that Mishenitein Rishus Lamashchis Lahashchis Eino Mavkin Ben Tzadik Russia, which is what really happened during the Holocaust. Happened in Egypt. When Hashem unleashes, unfurls the angel of death, meaning there's a plague, there's a war, there's going to be calamity, the Malach Amovis does not, the angel of death, does not distinguish between righteous and, and guilty and non-guilty. The Malach Amovis is given free hand and he can wreak havoc even amongst Tzadikim. And therefore, let's take the Holocaust, many righteous people died. It was a moment or a period when God unfurled the wrath of the angel of death on the, his people Israel and on the world, basically. And therefore, there is no distinction, was no distinction was drawn between a tzaddik and a rasha. And I think that's true of every battlefield. And therefore, soldiers who are shot and, God forbid, die on the battlefield, it's not because they were unworthy of living. It's because the Malach HaMavuz was unleashed on the battlefield. Excuse me. Yes. In this case, there is carrying in the world. Mikra. Well, that's what, that's, what, that's what this debate is about. I disagree with what he says. He disagrees with what I say. <laughs> you know, Two-way street here, folks. Anyway, I, that's my personal opinion. But there is another question. Forgetting about a war scenario, a plague scenario, COVID, not COVID, generally speaking, can a man or woman exercising free will kill an innocent person? So there is, again, a difference of opinion. The Gra would say, the Vilna Gong, no. That the person who dies has to be guilty of a capital offense or else he doesn't or she does not die. However, there are great, great Mepharshim who disagree with the Vilna Gong. The Nitziv of Aloshin disagrees with the Vilna Gong. The Malbo, not the Malbo, the Mitsuras David disagrees with the Vilna Gong. And the third one is the Orachayim Akadosh. The Orachayim disagrees with the Vilna Gong. So since I came late, I will continue a little bit over time. Is that okay with everybody? Sure. Okay. In what context, let's take the Orachayim. In what context does the Orachayim say that a person exercising free will can kill an innocent person? So we all are familiar with the story of Yosef and his brothers jump him. And initially, they want to kill him. Along comes Ruvain and says, do not kill him. Throw him into the pit. Do not kill our brother. Let's throw him into a pit. So, so the Torah tells us, The pit is empty. There is no water in the pit. Says Rashi, bringing the Chazal. There were snakes and scorpions, poisonous snakes, poisonous scorpions in the pit. And Reuven said, throw him into the pit. And then the Torah tells us, Reuven saved Yosef from the hands of his brothers who intended to kill him. Says the Orachayim, what do you mean he saved him? He had him thrown into a pit where the snakes and the scorpions would have bit him and he would have died. What was Reuven saying? We shouldn't kill him directly with our hands. Let him die in the pit. So why does the Torah say he saved him? Answers the Orachayim, Reuven didn't want him to die. Reuven knew he was a tzaddik. And therefore the scorpions and the snakes could not kill him. And if the scorpions and the snakes could not kill him, then what do you mean? He saved them. The brothers could also not kill him. Says the Orachayim, the brothers in the exercise of free will could have killed him. But the snakes and the scorpions who have no free will, they cannot kill an, an innocent person. And that's where the Orachayim says that if you're guilty of a sin, I'm sorry, if you are innocent of sin, a person, a individual, a human being exercising his or her free will can kill him. And the right. brothers could have killed him. As Rashi said that he was guilty of Rashonara. Good, that's what Rashi says. 
And that's a big question. Was he guilty? But it wasn't a capital offense. Okay. So if an animal kills somebody, he doesn't have free will of permission. That's right. That's right. So when now, you read about that, that's what it is. Okay. Now, that's the Arachai. The Nitziv says the exact same thing on the exact same source in the Torah and makes the same comment. The only little wrinkle he adds is that if the person is an absolute Sadi Gomor, not like Yosef because you say he had Lashon Hara, an absolute Sadi Gomor, even a human being cannot kill him. Okay. But generally speaking, a human being in the exercise of free will can kill an innocent person. Now, the Mitsuda Stavit says the same thing, but in a different context. The context is in um, Sefer Ezra, Nehemia, oh no, sorry, in Sefer Daniel, where it talks about Hanania, Mishal, and Azaria. You know what that means in English? This blew my mind. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. That's Hanania, Mishal, and Azaria translated into the English. I don't know how they got that. It's probably from the Septuagint. But anyway, Hanani, Mishol, and Azariah, who were tzaddikim, were thrown by Nebuchadnezzar into a fiery furnace when they refused to bow down to an image, uh, an idol. And um, it says there that Nebuchadnezzar stoked the oven to ten times its degrees of heat so that for sure they would burn up and die, but they lived. And then the Navi explains to us that they walked around in the fire, their hair was not singed, nor were their garments burned, and they just walked around in the fire until the Buchanetzar said to them, Tzu'upuku, come on out. So the Mitzvah Stavit says, why, why did they wait around inside the furnace? Why didn't they just walk out after they proved that they were not going to be burnt to death in this furnace, which was an awesome miracle? Why did they hang around in the oven? What was the delay? Why didn't they just walk out? Says the Mitzvah Stavit. They were afraid Nebuchadnezzar would personally kill them. The fire could not kill them because it has no intent. It doesn't have any free will. It does only what Hashem wants it to do. And Hashem said they were not guilty of a capital offense, therefore they're spared. However, Nebuchadnezzar, in the exercise of his free will, could have killed these innocent people. So there are three, the Orachayim, the Netziv, the Mitsuras David, who say that an individual, in the exercise of free will, can bring about the death of an innocent person. The, the Gra disagrees and says, no, there's no such thing, no innocent person dies if he's innocent or she's innocent, they won't die. They may get wounded, they make it main, whatever it is, but they won't die unless they're guilty of a capital offense in the eyes of God. Okay. Would that be a form of punishment if they're wounded? Or yeah, it would be a form them? of punishment, but it wouldn't be death. Okay. Now, why did we get into this? So they deserve that punishment. Okay, they deserve that punishment, and we talked about it, and it will play into Alicia, who's going to succeed Elio and Navi. And we're going to see a, a story by Alicia, which is going to be, so to speak, mind-boggling to us. He's going to cause the death or contribute to the death of 42 young people. And it's very much a mystery as to why that happens. And it is really in the same vein as his master, Elio, unfurling anger against those who denigrate the prophet, who mock the prophet, who demand that he descend, who want to take him in chains to the king, who disrespect the Novi, and that's why they died. And now Hashem tells them, go down, you have nothing to fear. Because normally you would fear. And that's why Eliyahu ran away from Ezebel, because he feared that she, in the exercise of free will, could have brought about his death. Why was he considered uh, fit for death and not at Sadi Gomar? Because of what he did to bring about the starvation of the people, and, uh, and in a sense force the hand of God and that was uh, considered and that's why Hashem fires him from being a prophet and that's really what his um, failure was in a sense although I don't know how we can say it but the Navi seems to say it and therefore um, he felt that he could be killed and therefore he was afraid to come down off the mountaintop until Hashem assured him that there's nothing to fear 
Thank you. Well, what about